Hello students. Welcome to my lecture on arboviruses. My name is Claudia Rueckert and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology here at UNR. My lab studies mosquito-borne viruses. I'm from Germany and I did my undergrad in biology and a master's in infectious diseases and then a PhD in virology. I came to the US for my postdoc at Colorado State University where I worked for about four and a half years. I hope the audio will work okay throughout this recording, but if at any point you have trouble understanding, please check my transcript file. It may also help to simply wear headphones because depending on the computer, the audio seems to be a bit low in volume. So please, if you have trouble understanding me right now, pause and grab some headphones. Um, I also apologize if at any point my dog makes any noises behind me. That might happen. So today you will learn a lot about arboviruses themselves but also about their vectors, because I think it's impossible to understand arboviruses without understanding vector-borne transmission itself. So what are arboviruses and what makes them so special? The term arboviruses is an abbreviation for arthropod-borne viruses, meaning that these viruses are transmitted by an arthropod vector to a vertebrate host. And this process includes active replication and dissemination in the arthropod vector. These viruses are not transmitted mechanically by contaminating the mouth parts of the arthropod. They do actually infect them and replicate in them. And I'll give you a bit more information on this later, as well as what an arthropod actually is. So essentially, the vector carries the virus from one host to another. You have a vector here, an infected host, and um, the vector directs transmission to an uninfected host, which can then continue the cycle. The only other routes for arboviruses to be transmitted would be, for example, a contaminated blood transfusion. And there are a few exceptions, such as Zika virus, which can be transmitted sexually. But we'll talk about that also a bit on a later slide. So the next main question is, what are arthropods? Arthropods are invertebrate animals that have a segmented body, meaning they have the head, thorax, and abdomen, and the abdomen is um, segmented as well. They also have paired joint appendages, so legs and wings in this case of, for mosquitoes. And their overall body structure from a developmental point of view is not all that different from us. However, arthropods do have an exoskeleton, which is usually formed from uh, out of a chitinous cuticle. There are five major groups of arthropods, myriapods, which are centipedes and millipedes, trilobites, which are an extinct marine arthropod group, Chelicerates, which includes spiders and ticks, crustaceans, which are, for example, shrimp, lobster, or crabs, and then insects, um, which I'm sure you are familiar with, and which include, for example, flies, mosquitoes, moths, true bugs, and so on. Arthropods really are incredibly diverse and among the most complex invertebrates. So now the next question is, which arthropods can serve as vectors? Well, first of all, arthropod vectors have to be hematophages, which means that they take blood meals on vertebrate animals. And they also generally pierce the skin with elaborate piercing, sucking mouth parts to find a vessel under the skin. Unlike some biting flies that merely make a cut on the surface of the skin and then sip from the collecting pool of blood. If you've been bitten by a horsefly, you kind of know what I mean. Another factor that determines whether an arthropod is a good vector is host preference. You can imagine that there are lots and lots of vertebrate hosts around, and not all of them can be infected with all arboviruses. So an arthropod that will feed on whatever comes along is probably not, good, not as good a vector as an arthropod that prefers to feed on a specific host, species, or type of host. For example, um, Aedes mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, are very efficient vectors for viruses such as Zika and Dengue, because they love to feed on humans, and these viruses replicate well in humans. So if you imagine this mosquito here being an Aedes aegypti, it transmits Zika from this infected host to an uninfected host, and both are human. This is the natural transmission cycle. But if this mosquito now is an Aedes aegypti and it has no specific host preference, it may feed on the infected human and then next feed, for example, on a cow. Well, a cow does not get infected with Zika, as far as we're aware. So this really represents a dead end for the virus. So a mosquito that feeds sometimes on a human, sometimes on a cow, sometimes on a bird, is not as efficient a vector for specific arboviruses. 
So the main vectors um, of arbovirus vectors are mosquitoes, ticks, sandflies, and culicoides biting midges. Mosquitoes are the most important arbovirus vectors, and we'll spend a fair amount of time on them on the next few slides and throughout the lecture. Ticks are actually also really important and transmit numerous viruses across the world. However, they do not feed on humans as much as mosquitoes, and cases overall are thus um, a bit lower for these viruses. We are generally considered dead-end hosts for both ticks and the arboviruses that they transmit, because we will see the tick, remove it, and kill it. I mean, for the most part. So a tick wouldn't really feed on us, pick up a virus, and pass it on. The viruses that we get from ticks usually cycle, for example, between rodent species and end up in humans by accident. Sandflies don't transmit a lot of viruses, and the ones that they do transmit occur rarely. There is a virus called Chandipura virus that can cause an, uh, severe encephalitis during outbreaks in India, but these outbreaks are rare and usually don't have a lot of cases. There's also Toscana virus and other related viruses that infect people in the Mediterranean, but these viruses are often asymptomatic and only rarely cause any severe disease. And then Culicotes biting midges are actually really important virus vectors, but not really for human pathogens, rather for animal pathogens. So they can transmit a few different animal viruses. The most well-known is probably blue tongue virus, which is a real virus that can cause severe disease in ruminants, mainly sheep, but also cattle and other ruminants. In sheep, the disease severity and mortality is really high, and they often present with a blue tongue due to a low oxygen saturation in the tongue. But as I said, we will focus on mosquitoes for now. So there are more than 3,000 species of mosquitoes. Now only a few are important as vectors for human pathogens. The most important genera of mosquitoes as vectors are Anopheles, Culex, and Aedes. There are other vectors in, for example, the Sabathes and Hemagobus groups, but those mosquitoes usually don't feed on humans, but rather on non-human primates. So they can be important vectors to cause spillover events from the jungle, so to speak. For example, um, they can transmit yellow fever virus between non-human primates. But we will stick with the main ones for now. So Anopheles are mostly known as vectors of plasmodium, which as you may know is a single cell organism that's a causative agent for malaria. But Anopheles can also transmit one virus, which is called Onyongyong virus. Um, it has caused a few outbreaks in East Africa, but it has not really spread any further, and the outbreaks have been far between. Um, then we have Culex mosquitoes, which are the main vectors of viruses in temperate regions such as the US or Europe, as well as large parts of Asia. Culex mosquitoes are often ornithophilic, meaning that they like to feed on birds, and we'll get into that a little bit more later when we talk about West Nile virus. And then there are Aedes mosquitoes, in particular Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These are the most important arbovirus vector in the tropics and subtropics, transmitting many viruses that can cause huge outbreaks, such as Zika virus, Dengue virus, and Chikungunya virus, all of which I will talk about later. So now let's talk a bit more about the actual viruses. I'm sure you guys learned this Baltimore scheme of classifying viruses at some point early on, and the virus groups that I've um, added here all include some or many arboviruses. So you can see that four of the seven classifications um, are represented in this scheme and that most arboviruses are in fact RNA viruses. The only arbovirus with a DNA genome is African swine fever virus which is the single member of the Asfaviridae family. It has a very large DNA genome and it is very poorly understood. The functions of most of the encoded viral proteins are still unknown. It is transmitted by soft ticks, um, and it can also spread through pig farms by contact and bodily fluids and so on, once it is introduced into a farm. It has, a, it has been an especially big problem for pig farmers in Eastern Europe over the last few years. And then we have rheoviruses, which have a double-stranded RNA genome that actually consists of 10 to 12 segments. Rheoviruses are our only non-enveloped group of viruses here, and arboviruses that are rheoviruses can be transmitted by culicoides midges that I mentioned before, and ticks 
Um, and there are not really any known human infecting ones, um, as far as I'm aware. Mostly these are animal viruses, uh, such as the before mentioned flu tongue. And while there are other real viruses that can cause disease in humans, these are not vector borne. And then there are Flaviviridae and Togaviridae, which have a single stranded positive sense RNA genome. And these families include a huge portion of the medically relevant arboviruses. And I will talk about both groups in more detail over the next few slides. And then finally, we have a few groups um, with single-stranded negative sense RNA genomes. And I'll talk about in some detail about Bunia viralis. Um, but briefly, Raptoviridae, you might know rabies virus as a raptovirus. In terms of arthropod-borne viruses, these include vesicula stomatitis virus, which is probably transmitted by sandflies. It's a little unclear, and it infects cattle, horses, and pigs. And then there's orthomyxoviridae, which you probably know because it's the family containing influenza virus. However, another genus in the family is thogotovirus, and this genus contains a few rare tick-borne viruses. So without going into too much detail, I wanted to include a few examples of combinations of viruses and vectors within the different families. So for example, we have Rift Valley fever virus here, which is a flebovirus within the Bunia viralis, and it's transmitted by mosquitoes. And then for example, we also have um, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, and my favoritely named virus, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus, um, both of which are transmitted by ticks. And then there's a few more examples of flaviviruses and uh, that are mosquito and tick transmitted, um, alpha uh, toga viruses, and then rio viruses. But really, now I'm going to focus on these three groups, flaviviridae, togaviridae, and bunia viralis. So the first family we'll talk about are the flaviviridae. There are four genera um, of flaviviridae. So there's flavivirus, um, hepasivirus, pegivirus, and pestivirus. All arboviruses are part of the flavivirus genus, which is then divided into mosquito-borne viruses, tick-borne flaviviruses, viruses without any known vector, and arthropod-specific viruses. We won't really talk about the ones that have no known vector. They may have a vector, and it's just not you know, clear. And then um, we won't really talk about arthropod-specific viruses either. They can be very important for arbovirus research, but I think today, for today's purpose, it would get a bit too much. So we will actually focus on mosquito-borne flaviviruses. As I mentioned earlier, flaviviruses are single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses. Like mRNA, they have a five prime cap. Uh, however, they do not have a poly A tail. The genome functions as an mRNA. So when it enters the cell, it is translated direct to, directly into a polyprotein that is then subsequently cleaved into the various viral structural um, and non-structural proteins using both cellular and viral proteases. The three prime end of the genome has an interesting structured area. It uh, contains various stem loops, and it is important to protect the viral genome from degradation by um, endonucleases in the cell. This region is also called the subgenomic flaviviral RNA, or short SFRNA, and has various functions in mammalian and insect cells. So it's, if anyone wants to know more about it, you should look it up. It's really interesting. The virus particle of flaviviruses is enveloped and contain, it consists of the capsid protein, the ma matrix protein, and the envelope protein, or short C, M, and E. Uh, the particle does not contain any other non-structural viral proteins. It only um, has the vir one copy of the viral genome. One aspect of flavivirus replication that is interesting and important to know is that they use the cellular protease furin to cleave a peptide off the uh, PRM protein, so the sort of the pre-M protein, uh, so that it becomes M. And you can kind of see here how that works. And um, immature particles that bud from the ER as spiky variants are transported through the Golgi into the trans-Golgi network, where acidification then induces 
a conformational change of the virion, um, and fewer cleavage takes place in the trans-Golgi network. But the PR, the PR part of PRM remains associated with PR. So you, again, you can kind of see that here in the ER, and then trans-Golgi network, it's, it's still kind of attached. And then when the virus enters the extracellular milieu is when the PR protein is released. Um, you can see these red areas that are kind of hidden by the PRM peptide. Um, the red areas are the fusion loop of E, which is crucial for virus entry. So an immature particle where the, um, where the fusion loop is hidden can't really enter a cell through the normal entry pathway. It needs to be mature with an exposed fusion loop to enter. When growing virus in cell culture, there's often a shortage of urine and cleavage can be inefficient, which means, which means that a lot of virus stocks actually contain a lot of immature particles. Now I want to talk a bit about a few specific flaviviruses. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about dengue fever. It's a huge problem in the tropical and subtropical areas across the world. This map shows which areas are at risk for dengue virus infections. It is based on suitable climate for the vector mosquitoes Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, so not necessarily where cases are occurring, but it corresponds to that pretty well. There are regular outbreaks of dengue fever in many countries across South and Central America, um, in Southeast Asia and Africa. And we have only seen occasional cases in Florida, in Texas and in parts of the Mediterranean region. These are usually contained very quickly. Dengue virus has likely been around for many centuries, if not millennia, but one of the first well-described epidemics that was likely caused by dengue virus was in 1779 and 1780 and it spread throughout Asia, Africa and North America. In 1906, dengue was shown to be transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes, and one year later it was shown to be a, due to a virus infection. It was only the second virus ever to be identified as a causative agent of disease. Of course, at the time, that wasn't you know, an EM picture or a genomic, genomic sequence. It was merely showing that uh, the agent was filtrable, like after filtration, it was still infectious. Infection with dengue virus often results in a flu-like disease, shown over here is the febrile face, I wouldn't call it the less serious disease mild, since it can cause severe muscle pain, joint pain, fever, rash, nausea, pain around the eyes, and general headaches. It is also called breakbone fever, so it's not pleasant even if it's sort of a milder case of it. However, um, it can sometimes go into a severe critical phase. So dengue infection can cause platelet counts to drop, which leads to hemorrhaging. And it can also make the linings of blood vessels leaky, which can result in fluid building up in the lungs, which is called pleural effusion. Um, it can lead to fluid in the chest and abdominal cavities, which is ascites. Um, and as I said, bleed, uh, bleeding and a decreased blood supply to vital organs. So this is often called the so-called dengue shock syndrome. And some people... Some people obviously die, and uh, a lot of people spend months in hospitals recovering from dengue fever. Uh, there are four dengue virus serotypes, and each of these generates a distinct antibody response during infection. These antibodies can be cross-protective for other serotypes if the person is infected soon after the initial infection. However, as antibodies drop over time, they can become less protective and instead instead even enhance infection with another serotype and actually cause more severe disease. So this process is called antibody-dependent enhancement, or ADE. And here is a way to visualize this. You can see on the surface of the cells two proteins. Um, one is the receptor for dengue virus, and one is an FC gamma receptor, which is a receptor for the non-variable part of the antibody, so like this part here. In a normal infection scenario shown here on the right, uh, the virus binds to its receptor to infect cells, as you can see here. It can, cannot bind the FC gamma receptor. On the left side, we have a scenario with a high concentration of neutralizing antibodies, so these antibodies can bind the virus and make it non-infectious. 
which is what, why we call them neutralizing. The dangerous scenario is shown in the middle, where we have some antibodies that bind to the virus and essentially they are not enough to neutralize it. And instead, these antibodies can now bind the virus and the FC gamma receptor on the surface, uh, which can mediate entry of the virus into cells they don't normally infect or through an alternative route at least. The other issue with this is that immature particles that I talked about before normally can't enter cells to infect them. However, if antibodies bind to them in, in this fashion, they can infect cells with FC gamma receptors on their surface. And this can change disease progression and cytokine profiles and is one hypothesis for the severe disease during a secondary dengue infection. However, I should note that severe dengue can also occur during a primary infection, just less frequently. Another suspected mechanism in general for severe dengue fever is that the non-structural protein 1 of dengue virus can increase endothelial permeability, resulting in the described hemorrhaging and fluid leaking. Now we'll change to another flavivirus that is possibly of more importance to the US and specifically Nevada. West Nile virus was introduced into the US in 1999. It was one of the first major emergences of an arbovirus into a completely new territory. In the summer of 1999, cases of encephalitis occurred in New York City and upstate New York that were attributed to West Nile virus infection by October 1999. The virus seems to have originated in the Middle East, probably Israel, and was likely introduced by a traveler. West Nile infection is often asymptomatic, but it can cause a flu-like disease, and in roughly 1 in 150 cases, the patients develop severe neuroinvasive disease. So that could be encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, or meningitis, which is an inflammation of the membrane surrounding the brain. Both can be fatal, and while many patients do recover, they often have neurological sequelae, so after effects, such as paralysis or frequent severe headaches. From 1999 to 2003, West Nile spread through the continental U.S. and established itself in most states. Case numbers are particularly high in the Great Plains states, and it has also had a dev devastating effect on the American bird population, in particular crows. And we'll get in to a moment about into its transmission cycle. It can also infect horses, but by 2003, the first vaccine was already released for veterinary use. Uh, we just still don't have a vaccine license for human use. And since 2003, the virus is stably established in the U.S. Neuroinvasive cases occur every year in the majority of U.S. states, including Nevada. And often 50,000 and over 50,000 neuroinvasive cases have been recorded in the U.S. to date. So the reason why birds are impacted by West Nile virus is that the natural transmission cycle for West Nile virus is between birds uh, sorry, birds and mosquitoes, specifically Culex mosquitoes. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that Culex mosquitoes often have a host preference for birds. So the, vi the virus actually replicates and amplifies in bird hosts, such as American robins or sparrows, and is passed between these birds and Culex mosquitoes. Later in the summer, there are a lot of Culex, Culex mosquitoes, and they will also use the opportunity to feed on mammals, such as uh, humans or horses. We then become infected with West Nile virus, but are generally considered dead end hosts because humans do not actually develop a high viremia. And uh, if we don't have enough virus in our blood, we cannot really pass it on to new mosquitoes. In the US, you can see that a lot of cases over the last 20 years have occurred in the Great Plains states, such as the Dakotas, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado, um, also Montana. Uh, New Mexico and Arizona. And uh, Nevada has, doesn't have a high incidence over the whole 20 years, but if you look at specific years, in this case 2019, Nevada was actually one of the states with the highest numbers of neuroinvasive West Nile disease in the whole US, together with Arizona and New Mexico. Um, so all of these, and all of these cases happened in Clark County and Washoe County. So West Nile virus is the main arbovirus to be aware of in Nevada. The last flavivirus that we're going to talk about is Zika virus. You're probably well aware of it. It received a lot of press in 2016 and became a major public health concern during that time. 
Uh, Zika virus was actually first identified in 1947 in the Zika forest in Uganda. It had also spread to Southeast Asia already in the 60s, uh, but didn't cause a lot of cases or attention. And then in 2007, there was a relatively large outbreak on Yap Island in Micronesia, bringing attention to this little known virus for the first time, but only to the arbovirus community. Similarly, scientists started worrying about it a bit more in 2013 and 2014 during a large outbreak in French Polynesia, but it did not, it did not really get any public attention. And from French Polynesia, the vi you can kind of see uh, the progression here, Yap Island, and then from Pr French Polynesia, it spread to Easter Island, in, uh, which is part of Chile, in the South Pacific, and from there to Brazil, probably still in 2014, even though it says 2015 here. In Brazil, it then spread throughout the country, it spread through to Colombia um, and the rest of the Americas throughout 2015 and 2016. By the end of 2017, so many people have been affected that there is sufficient herd immunity for the virus to seemingly disappear. I don't think it really disappeared completely, and I think we will probably get somewhat regular, smaller outbreaks over uh, in the future. During its activity in the Americas, it was also reintroduced to other areas such as Africa and Asia due to travel. Zika virus is transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, like dengue, but it can also be transmitted sexually and vertically from mother to fetus. In this aspect, it is kind of a unique among arboviruses. Um, also, 80% of the cases are presumed to be asymptomatic, and most symptomatic cases are characterized by a rash, uh, conjunctivitis, and mild fever. Symptoms can be easily mixed up with a mild course of dengue, which is probably why it was not immediately re recognized in the Brazil outbreak. Many people would have assumed it is dengue. During this large outbreak in the Americas, with millions of cases, some new disease manifestations were observed. So in some adults, for example, it can cause what's called Guillain-Barré syndrome. Guillain-Barré syndrome is a rare disease manifestation in which the immune system attacks otherwise healthy nerves. So first, symptoms might be weakness and tingling in the extremities, which can then quickly spread and result in paralysis of the whole body. However, patients can be treated by plasma exchange, in which the antibodies are essentially removed from the blood or by giving a high dose of antibodies from healthy donors that can block the immune system from attacking nerves. And the recovery rates are pretty high with um, few sort of after effects. And then finally, the one symptom that most of you will probably have heard of is microcephaly of newborns that were infected during preg pregnancy. Microcephaly describes a reduced head circumference. And in Zika infections, um, it is suggested that this is due to the virus infecting the fetus during pregnancy and then killing neurons in, de in the developing brain. Many fetus fetuses were actually probably aborted from this infection, and some are born with microcephaly. Some show developmental disorders despite having a normal head size, and then, of course, some newborns were also healthy. But it, a, few years, a few years later now, it's becoming slowly clearer how many newborns were in, were impacted. Um, the, it is clear that the emotional and economic impact this has had on Brazil is enormous. It's hard to find a concrete number, but I found one art, NPR article saying that over 3,700 babies were born with birth defects from Zika virus infection. Um, yeah, this is all I will say about Zika virus. Instead, we will now switch to our next group, the Toga Viridae. The Toga Viridae consists of only two, ge two gen genera, sorry, alpha virus and ruby virus. The ruby virus genus contains only one virus, rubella virus. The genus alpha virus contains mostly arboviruses. There are two aquatic alpha viruses that infect fish and that are not known to be vector borne. And then there's a few insect specific alpha viruses which are not known to infect um, vertebrate hosts. In addition, there is one alpha virus here um, called Southern Elephant Seal virus, which may be transmitted by a louse, but it is unclear. So it might not be vector borne, but probably is transmitted by a louse. All other alpha viruses are transmitted by mosquitoes. And then important to note are that highly pathogenic alpha viruses include um, the equine encephalitis viruses, uh, especially Eastern equine encephalitis which is rare in humans, but it has an 
extremely high mortality rate of at least 30%, with about 50% of survivors having severe long-term sequelae, so after effects of disease. And there was a relatively large outbreak of it last year across the sort of northeastern US. Alpha viruses are also positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Their genome essentially looks like mRNA. It has a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail. The RNA can be directly translated into two polyproteins, the structural polyprotein and the non-structural polyprotein. And alpha viruses have these two open reading frames, which means um, they can generate whole genomic RNA, but also this subgenomic RNA that contains only the structural proteins. This is a great way for the virus to ensure it has enough structural proteins to assemble its viruses and package the genomes. The particles are enveloped and only one genomic RNA and no other proteins are packaged. We will focus on the alpha virus that had caused the largest disease outbreak so far, chikungunya virus. Similar to Zika virus and many other viruses, it was first identified in the 50s in East Africa and is generally transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. The first major newsworthy outbreak of chikungunya occurred in 2006 and 2007 on the French territory La Réunion, which is an island in the Indian Ocean close to Madagascar. This chikwi strain had acquired a mutation in its envelope protein compared to previous strains, which enabled it to be transmitted more efficiently by Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. Since Al Aedes albopictus are abundant in some of the areas where less Aedes aegypti are, this adaptation to Aedes albopictus facilitated this outbreak um, and the virus spread across the Indian Ocean to many other areas. And it resulted in effectively two lineages of chickweed um, circulating. The one that has, that's called the Asian lineage that doesn't have this mutation that adapts it to Aedes albopictus and then the Indian Ocean lineage, which has this mutation. So the red virus here is essentially not as well transmitted by Aedes albopictus. In contrast to um, Zika virus and West Nile virus, most cases of chikungunya are symptomatic. Asymptomatic cases are very rare. And chikungunya fever is characterized by severe, <clears throat> sorry, severe joint pain and muscle pain with high fever. There's often a rash and sometimes also conjunctivitis. Very rarely, it can cause neurological complications. The main concern, however, with chikungunya virus is that infection very commonly persists and causes joint and muscle pain for months or even years. So now we'll talk about Bunya viralis. Previously, we had a family called Bunya viridae, but about three years ago, this was all reorganized and in my opinion, is now unnecessarily complicated. We'll just focus on a few things here. Arboviruses that are Bunya viruses have a mostly negative sense RNA genome, single-stranded, and it's made of three segments, the large, medium, and small segments. The small segment can contain ambisense sequences, meaning that it encodes protein from both the genomic and antigenomic RNA. The arbovirus groups among the Bunya viralis are fleboviruses, nairoviruses, and orthobunya viruses. And important arboviruses include Rift Valley fever virus, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, and La Crosse encephalitis virus, which is present in the US as well. Uh, these three viruses are highly pathogenic, but luckily um, they are much more rarely um, occurring compared to, for example, Zika or dengue virus. Briefly, here you can see the three segments of um, the Bunya virus genome and how it's packaged, packaged into the virion. So virions are enveloped and all three genome segments are surrounded by the nucleoprotein and they have a viral polymerase bound to it. The nucleoprotein protects the viral RNA from degradation by cellular exonucleases and the viral polymerase can start productive positive sense mRNA production as soon as the virus enters the cell. Without the viral polymerase, the RNA could not really do anything inside the cell because it is the negative sense RNA, so it's not translated into protein. So finally, I want to talk a bit more about the mechanisms and concepts of arbovirus transmission. We have talked about vectors and we've talked about viruses, so now let's put them together with the example of a mosquito. The anatomy in other arthropods can be a bit different, but the principle is going to be the same. 
Essentially, the virus has to do a few things here. When a mosquito takes a blood meal, it can take up an arbovirus with its blood meal. The arbovirus then ends up in the midgut lumen and it needs to infect the midgut epithelial cells to replicate. If the virus cannot enter the epithelial cells, it's a dead end. The virus ends up being digested essentially with the blood meal. In the midgut epithelium, once it has infected it, it uh, replicates and spreads, and then it has to pass this basal lamina that surrounds the midgut. It's an extracellular matrix, um, and the virus can sort of get trapped in there if there's not enough you know, numbers to kind of get through. Once the virus has passed the basal lamina, it will replicate in all kinds of tissues across the mosquito. So that can be muscle cells, nerve cells, hemocytes, which are essentially blood cells of mosquitoes. And finally, it has to make it into the salivary glands. It has to infect the salivary glands and replicate in the salivary glands because the virus will be transmitted with saliva during a subsequent blood meal. So we need to have sufficient amounts of virus in the saliva for transmission to occur. And the ability of a certain vector, or mosquito in this case, to transmit a specific virus is called vector competence. So if a vir virus can do this whole process in a specific mosquito and make it out through the saliva again, um, the mosquito is a competent vector. I've also um, linked two videos here that are really cool. One of them is the mosquito probing with its um, mouth parts under the skin. So you can kind of see it looking for a blood vessel. And then in this video, they explain a little bit more how that process works. Um, and I think they have a little clip of the other video in that as well. So if you're interested, check out how mosquito blood feeding works. And so I just explained to you vector competence. Another concept important in arbovirology is vectorial capacity. It's a more comprehensive way to describe whether a mosquito is a good vector for a given virus. Um, the formula is equivalent to the basic, rec basic reproduct reproductive number R0, which you may have learned about for other viruses. So it defines the total number of potentially infectious bites that would arise from all mosquitoes feeding on a perfectly infectious human on one day. It takes into account vector competence, so whether the mosquito actually can transmit the virus at all and how well. Um, it will also consider a bunch of ecological parameters. So these include vector density, how many mosquitoes are there in this area, how dense are, is the population, um, it, the probability of a host being fed upon, which rel relates to you know, living condition, human behavior, but also host preference of the mosquito, um, whether you know it prefers to feed on humans or not. And then, as I said, vector competence. Extrinsic incubation period. This is the time that it takes for the virus to make it from the midgut to the saliva. So if you look at this process, how long does it take from here, once it's gone all the way around, back out into the next host? And then finally, the probability of daily survival. So if a mosquito can't really survive well under the conditions where there's a lot of predators, then obviously it has a lower chance of um, feeding on another host and transmitting a virus. And vector competence and vectorial capacity are two very important concepts in arbovirology. So briefly, we'll talk about arbovirus emergence. When the public hears about an arbovirus emergence, it's usually here. The virus is spreading globally, um, and we have a lot of cases, and it's in the news. Underlying this is often, but not always, a switch in the host vector system. So for example, this green virus here is cycling between non-human primates and a certain mosquito species, the green mosquito, in the African tropical rainforest. We would call this sylvatic transmission, which means forest transmission. Now, due to changes in the land use and humans getting into this ecosystem, you could imagine that another mosquito species is now exposed to this virus, here this blue mosquito. And if the blue mosquito now prefers to feed on humans, it could result in a spillover event into urban transmission. So the switch could have underlying changes in vector competence. So this blue mosquito suddenly becomes competent for the virus because the virus um, goes through a small change, like I mentioned earlier, for a chikungunya virus, and suddenly we have transmission between human, humans and mosquitoes.
And underlying this change in vector competence is usually a change in the specific cellular virus mosquito interactions. And that's what we'll quickly have a look at, look at and talk about over the next slide. So there's a few cellular virus interaction um, principles that underlie vector competence, but we'll focus for now on mosquito antiviral responses. So we're talking about the immune response of mosquitoes, essentially. And as you can see on this beautiful figure, studying antiviral immune response to mosquitoes is a bit complex. And this is really only a small part of the interactions between viruses and mosquitoes. But this is what my lab studies. And we can talk about it a bit more tomorrow if anyone is interested. I just want to point out here that these things here on the left side are signaling pathways, part of the innate immune system. And there is a toll pathway, the IMD pathway, which stands for immune deficiency. So if you knock it out, their mosquitoes are immune deficient. And then the JAK-STAT pathway. And you will probably hear a bunch about the JAK-STAT pathway and maybe the toll pathway as well in your next lecture about the innate immune system in mammalian systems. All three pathways have some trigger. Something happens either extracellularly or in another cell. And this triggers the signaling pathway downstream. That's usually some sort of phosphorylation that occurs. And then you have, with STAT, you have a dimerization. The STAT can then travel to the nucleus and it induces the expression of antimicrobial genes or specific other genes. And some of these antimicrobial genes can be antiviral. Now on the right side here, we have the RNA interference pathway. And in arthropods, and also in plants actually, RNA interference is an antiviral mechanism. It is not in mammalian systems, or not fundamentally at least, but in mosquitoes and other arthropods, RNAi is a very specific antiviral response. So when a virus enters the cell, it will ultimately produce double-stranded RNA as a replication intermediate or as part of its genome. So for example, a toga virus that has a positive sense RNA genome needs to make a negative sense RNA genome and becomes double-stranded. A rhea virus already comes double-stranded into the cell. And this double-stranded RNA is foreign to the cell. It's, we don't normally have double-stranded RNA in the cytosol. And because it is foreign, this enzyme called DICER2 will recognize the viral double-stranded RNA as foreign and cleave it into small 21 nucleotide small RNAs. These 21 nucleotide small RNAs can then target viral RNA. So you have an example here uh, of the viral RNA, and this is supposed to represent a small 21 nucleotide small RNA. It guides this protein called um, Argonaut 2, which is part of the RNA induced silencing complex um, to the viral RNA and is cleaved. So Argonaut 2 has slicer activity, it just kind of slices the RNA and leads to degradation of the viral genome. So RNAi is thus a fairly efficient and sequence specific antiviral response in arthropods. I could probably spend a whole lecture talking about mosquito antiviral responses or RNAi, but I'll keep it to this one slide to give you an idea of how it works. And instead, we'll move on to the question of how do we control arboviruses. So in my final two slides, I want to talk about this aspect. Um, we have the traditional approach of vaccines and another in technically very traditional approach is vector control. So with vaccines, like any other virus, we can try to generate vaccines to protect humans from disease. And this approach works relatively well for yellow fever virus and Japanese encephalitis virus. If you travel to an area where these, are, these viruses are a risk to you, you can get the vaccine. And similarly, in these regions, public health officials try to keep vaccination rates high to protect people. However, for all other viruses that still need a vaccine, the process of vaccine development, testing, and licensing, licensing is incredibly slow. So what people have generally done is try to control vector populations. Vector control aims at reducing the population of vectors. 
and this can be achieved through the use of insecticides for insect vectors or acaricides for tick vectors. However, insecticides often have environmental impacts and people aren't always happy when insecticides are sprayed across fields to try and reduce Culex mosquitoes, for example, because they may also kill the bees and, and for a lot of insecticides that's a fair point. Um, the other issue is that mosquitoes can rapidly develop resistance to insecticides. So with that's a big problem with Anopheles mosquitoes in Africa and with Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in South America. A lot of the mosquito populations already have resistance to insecticide and it doesn't really help much to, to use them. So another strategy that works uh, but is a little bit difficult to implement is sterile insect technique. This essentially means mass rearing and mass sterilization of male mosquitoes and these are then released to mate with the local female mosquito population. So the sterile males will mate with the females, the females will then lay eggs that are also sterile and won't hatch. So effectively you're reducing the overall population by the competition of these sterile mosquitoes with the native ones. Um, sterilization can be achieved through radiation and then in more modern techniques, transgenic mosquitoes are used for a similar effect. And finally, another relatively new approach is to use a bacterium called Wolbachia. Wolbachia containing male mosquitoes that mate with females not containing Wolbachia would produce non-viable offspring. Um, there's a video below that I will urge you to look at that explains that in a bit more detail. So the most modern method to control um, our virus is to control transmission itself without reducing the actual mosquito populations or vaccinating people. And there are two main strategies. One is making transgenic mosquitoes that just cannot transmit virus due to some sort of transgene that was added. And then using Wolbachia bacteria that I mentioned before to introduce into the mosquito population. And these Wolbachia mosquitoes can reduce virus transmission. Um, there's a lot of papers, I think it's been known for over 10 years now, and um, you can learn more about this project, the, uh, it's called the World Mosquito Program, I think, in this YouTube video. It's only three minutes long, and I think it's worth watching. And then the next thing that I want to talk about is this development of transgenic mosquitoes that cannot transmit virus. So there are two pretty new, really cool methods, both established by the same lab, the Akbari lab at UC San Diego, and they were both published over the last year. And the first approach makes use of the RNA interference pathway. The auth authors essentially made transgenic mosquitoes that express these double-stranded RNA molecules that are complementary to the Zika genome. And this double-stranded RNA is processed into small RNAs, these as iRNAs I mentioned earlier. And these siRNAs can then target Zika virus as soon as it enters the cells. It kind of makes the cells prepared for infection. And um, this seems to work pretty well the way they've designed it. The other approach, which I think is even cooler and maybe more um, likely to work long term, are these mosquitoes that essentially make antibodies against all four serotypes of dengue in their midguts. So the authors made mosquitoes that express these antibodies in the midgut to target incoming virus with the antibodies and effectively neutralize the virus as soon as it enters the mosquito. I think both studies are incredibly cool and show how basic research can inform these really cool applied control, control strategies. Well, Dr. Rosetto actually asked me to share a bit about what my lab does specifically. I think I've taken up a lot of your time listening to me talk about arboviruses. And maybe we can talk a bit more about my research tomorrow at the Zoom meeting, if you have any questions about it. Essentially, we study the detailed mechanisms of how mosquitoes control virus replication. We study both known antiviral pathways and we try to discover novel antiviral me mechanisms in mosquitoes. And that includes having, you know, mosquito colonies in the lab, doing virus assays, and hopefully having a lot of fun. I hope you have enjoyed learning about arboviruses and are as interested in them as I am. If you have any questions, I will be available at the Zoom chat tomorrow at 1030.
and you can also me email me below or check out my website. Thank you.